I'd like to now turn to Dr. Estelle Merrerberger, a senior translational safety leader at Roche. She'll be presenting on optimizing early clinical investigations by increasing the predictive value of non-clinical activities. Thank you, David. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today, and I'm very thankful about the opportunity to share with you this translational package, which uh, supported the entry into human of uh, T-cell bispecific, currently tested in a phase one dose escalation in AML patients. The particularity of this package is that it was built with human and patient model systems as opposed to animal studies. And I will try to highlight through the presentation all the efforts uh, made and uh, particularly uh, our lessons learned. Next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about the molecule. Um, so here we are gonna be talking about a T cell by specific. These molecules are matchmakers between a cytotoxic T cells and a tumor cell. And the matchmaking will lead to the lysis of the tumor cell. We uh, at Roche have uh, uh, a molecule and antibodies that uh, have a two plus one format, which means that we target uh, twice the, 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 the tumor um, and we engage the cytotoxic T cell via the CD3 epsilon uh, binding. And here, um, generally, these uh, CD3 by specific target oncoproteins, but here the particularity of the case I'm going to present today is that we target not a protein, but a peptide that is presented by an MHC class one molecule. So we target complexes of oncopeptide and MHC class one. And here we target a peptide that is coming from a, a non-coprotein called Williams tumor one that is going to be presented by HLA-A2. WT1 is an intracellular transcription factor that is overexpressed in leukemia and AML and ALL and solid cancer. In adult, this uh, oncoprotein is, has an expression that is restricted to a few tissue like kidney, um, testes and ovaries, a few mesothelial cells and bone marrow. Next slide. So here, um, these molecules, um, have the particularity to target MHC peptide complexes, and this bears certain challenges, especially for safety. When you develop this molecule, the non-safety, the non-clinical safety assessment has to be done a little bit differently. Why? Because these targets are exquisitely human. And this unvalidate the conventional animal testing approach because these molecules lack cross-reactivity in animal species. Also, the entire toolbox, actually, of the toxicologist is not applicable to these programs. And in addition, as an additional challenge, you have an increased risk for off-targeting. Um, uh, cross reactivities because by targeting only a nine mer peptide, you can imagine that there are lots of promiscuous peptide that will also be presented by HLA-E2 that could eventually be bound by the molecule if this is not exclusively uh, selective. So this uh, is about the challenges faced, but there is there, are, there were also lots of opportunities. There are opportunities for us to think uh, about different ways to build on a PKPD safety translational package with human and patient derived material and uh, actually test uh, whether or not we can increase the predictive value by predicting from human to human. Next slide. So this is our non-clinical strategy for entry into human, and it was entirely based on NAMS. 
And from this approach, we derived uh, the therapeutic index, the starting dose, and the pharmacologically active dose range. So in regards to safety, to um, ensure that the molecule is targeting uh, selectively the complexes we, we want to, we build a strategy around three main pillars that we used iterative, iteratively to potentiate the risk identification. Because I said, with this molecule, every time you bind a healthy cell, you will kill it. So we, 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 the first pillar was um, looking at testing the molecule in vitro in a broad range of human 2D, 3D models. The second pillar was a ligandome elucidation with human vital organ lysates. And in this pillar, we used the clinical candidate to actually fish potential off target from uh, a, a vital organ lysates. And we complemented the package with a study in HLA-A2 transgenic mice. The risk, the safety risk identified was were integrated. So the qualitative aspect was integrated with a quantitative uh, assessment, a PKPD assessment to define a therapeutic index. And by saying that, I already um, um, give it away that we had a flag in our in vitro testing package. And the entire PKPD safety data that we produced um, were used to uh, define a starting dose and a risk management plan. Next slide. So this is our first pillar, basically. We, we did the risk identification using human 2D, 3D in vitro systems. As you can see, we had a broad diversity of different human primary cells that we tested. And the way we test this T cell by specific is by uh, exposing a co-culture of human primary cells with allogenic or autologous PBMCs. So we test a broad range of our TCB and we also look at a time course. So we evaluate the effect uh, across a, a broad uh, a time course. We monitor different endpoints and these endpoints are also looked at in the context of this time course and are integrated in a PKPD model um, all together to basically look at the effect. And as you can see here, I already flagged in red the liver spheroids. So uh, I will be talking in the next slide about the flag that we had uh, when we tested our molecule on liver spheroids. Next slide, please. So here, and you can click another time. Thank you. So here, when we tested our WT1 TCB on liver spheroids, um, and, and we knew that the target was absent from, from these spheroids, we could uh, see a minimal lysis in these spheroids. As you can see here, we monitored LDH as a surrogate for lysis of cell, killing of cell, AST as a biomarker for hepatotoxicity, and IL-6 as cytokines that are released after the TCB elicit its effect. What was very important for us is to control this system with different negative and positive controls. So the negative control, we use spheroid only. We use the vehicle. The negative control that was used was the CD3, uh, the, the CD3 arm of the bispecific without the tumor targeting arm. Here, I apologize, in blue is our positive control it is called ESK1. It's a molecule that is targeting uh, the WT1 peptide presented by HLA-A2 as our WT1 TCB, but this molecule is known to be unselective. So it's basically killing every primary cell co-culture uh, with PBSC that we can think of. So next slide, when we realized that we had a flag, the question was, I know what, what, what are we gonna do? So when you do an assessment based on in vitro data, 
um, the, you, you face a certain level of complexity in translating these in vitro effects uh, into uh, a human, into the context of a human body. You, you, it, it's a little bit challenging to assess quantitatively actually uh, what it is um, uh, all about. And, and when you have a, a, an effect, you need to define the threshold of significant, significance for your effect. You also need a therapeutic index and you need eventually to look at causality and exacerbating context. Next slide. So we did that in a lot of different follow-up assays that we run and to really uh, uh, look at consistency of effect and define our threshold for significance, we looked at different conditions, HLA-E2 negative versus HLA-E2 positive. We took allogenic PBMC, but we also run the same experiment using autologous uh, PBMCs to check what level of alloreactivity was intrinsic to the system with allogenic. We looked at different uh, biomarkers, LDH for lysis, alpha GST as a very strong marker for hepatotoxicity, an early marker. We looked at inter interferon gamma, granzyme B, and by evaluating the full package, we uh, concluded that uh, based on our dynamic in vitro killing assay and assessment, we had a mild but consistent signal at one microgram per ml. So next slide. So um, as I mentioned before, the, the grading of severity of an effect in the context of an in vitro model is not an easy thing to do. So we decided to go after potentially the causality of uh, this uh, signal, and we went after the identification of the off-target. And to do that, we run, uh, as I mentioned before, the interactome assay, where we used our uh, WT1 CCB clinical candidate to fish the off-target from human primary hepatocyte lysis. From this effort, we isolated about 70 different peptides, knowing that this assay would lead to false positive. But we follow up with a lot of orthogonal testing, which led us to one epitope as the, the, the only potential re, uh, uh, causality of the signal that we were using, uh, we were observing in the hepatocytes, which was an epitope coming from a cytochrome P450, uh, the CYP8B1. And actually to substantiate our claim that the effect was minimal at one microgram per ml, and to also substantiate the, the, um, the, the naming uh, of the threshold as being conservative, we ran a synapse stability uh, uh, assay to look how stable the synapse formed with the targeted peptide, which is the RMF peptide from WT1, is compared to the off-target, the CYP8B1, because the, the killing potency or the killing efficiency is increased uh, in function of synapse stability. And here we could definitely show that with the off-target, we had a less uh, efficient killing process than with the on-target. Next slide. So this led us to further investigate the therapeutic, uh, to derive a therapeutic index from the experiment that we ran. So from a safety perspective, as I mentioned, we use the primary liver spheroids, and we use this uh, uh, ex vivo in vitro uh, framework, and we decided to apply a harmonized um, uh, experimental design to look at efficacy. And to look at efficacy, we use primary, primary AML samples. And by applying this harmonized experimental design, we could evidence that we had a therapeutic window. And with a translational PKPD modeling strategy, we could define that our efficacious uh, range would be actually uh, where 
uh, we would have only very minimal effect on the hepatocyte. Next slide. So um, we leverage actually also the efficacy uh, model that was used with primary AML samples for the patient-centric starting dose prediction. And um, uh, actually, you know, classically, uh, we use an in vitro MABEL approach to derive the starting dose. And this classical in vitro MABEL approach uses the most sensitive tumor cell line and the most sensitive readout to derive the starting dose. Here, we decided to go for a system that we found most relevant to predict. And uh, ultimately, we manage to start as um, at a much higher dose of 150 microgram compared to a five microgram dose derived from a standard MABEL approach, which enabled to reduce the number of patients treated with subtherapeutic doses. Next slide. So really quickly, and we can move to the next one, our learnings. It's very important to understand your system and your testing framework. You have to leverage the strength of the system, but be aware of its limitation. In the context of our assay, uh, when, when testing uh, TCB bispecific, um, we use a very dynamic system. So it's very important to uh, evaluate the concentration effect relationship through our time course as long as the system allows and integrates all the data into what we call an area under the effect curve. So that's a very critical step. Next slide. It's also very important to understand what biological effects you are going to follow and to follow it from the beginning to the end with different relevant biomarkers. And it's important to look at consistency of your signal. And next slide. Also, it's very um, important to um, try to use material for your testing that is relevant for the patient uh, you are going to um, uh, uh, test the drug into later on. And here again, the patient derived material enabled the balancing act to achieve a higher starting dose uh, for this CD3 by specific. Next slide. So ultimately, um, we, we received a broad regulatory approval for this package. We dosed the first patient in November 2020, and the entry into human dose predicted from this patient-derived AML blast and autologous PBMC was safe. So far, we have no evidence for liver toxicity up to a dose of 12 milligram, which is way beyond our one microgram per ML threshold. But also what we can say is that this, the patient-centric framework is of high predictive value for the estimation of the pharmacologically active dose range. Next slide, maybe just quickly an outlook and then we can move to the next. So, and, and you can click through, please. So here we know uh, by now that patient-derived material uh, is of high value in the preclinical and translational development. But our next, step in, in our vision is to leverage this ex vivo testing in the phase one clinical trial to identify responders and predict efficacious dose. And next slide, this is what we are currently doing in the context of this phase one dose escalation. Um, we are looking at individual ex vivo versus clinical in vivo PKPD. And we use our primary AML um, uh, model and the, the testing framework on the, 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 the bone marrow uh, samples we get from the patient enrolled in the trial to predict the ex vivo potency. We combine that with the individual PK, and we actually, in this pilot, try to understand to which extent this ex vivo model plus testing framework could predict the right dose for each patient individually by comparing actually in vivo data in the context of the clinical trial. Okay, I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for your attention and I'm welcoming any of your questions.